Good evening. I'm sure after Paul's fantastic talk, your ears are still ringing with excitement. So what I'd like to do is transfer some of that excitement from your ears to your eyes. And to do that, I'd like you to focus on the stage for me and try and gather as much information as you can. And as you do that, I'd like you to picture the light waves traveling from the image towards your eye, converging on the back of your eye, stimulating the nerve fibers, and sending energized electrical signals back into your brain, all the way back, tra traveling further to the deepest, most remote parts of your brain, eventually forming the same image in your visual cortex at the very back of your brain. Now I want you to stop. Imagine this entire process but completely in reverse. So what if we were able to use the eye and its natural connection with the brain, not only to deliver essential visual information to the brain, but to allow us to extract information from the brain? Now, as exciting as this concept sounds, it's certainly not novel. In fact, it's not even modern. The origins of the principle of using the eye as a window to the soul can in fact be dated all the way back to the biblical era. In fact, some references even predate the Bible. And in the evolution of time, this concept has been used beautifully in a number of scenarios. So women in medieval times would deliberately dilate their pupils in an effort to reveal more of themselves and make themselves more attractive to potential suitors. Unfortunately, in doing this, with dilated pupils. They couldn't see anything, so they, they had no idea who these potential suitors were. <laughs> but this concept would later be, centuries later, be validated scientifically. So the size of our pupils directly correlate to our levels of attractiveness and levels of arousal. Decades later, psychologists would aim to prove that the size of our pupils correlate with cognitive function. So the harder we think, the more our pupils dilate. In fact, when we've reached our maximum cognitive function, the pupil is dilated four times its baseline diameter. And they used this experiment to great amusement, predicting which of their students would perform best in tests based on the size of their pupil. And with incredible accuracy. And in so doing, they validated the eye, not only as a window to the soul, but also to the mind. But could we use the eye and its natural connection with the brain as a window directly to the brain. Not only to deliver information, but to allow us to extract critical information. And in so doing, allow us to potentially change the way we treat certain life-threatening conditions. So the piece of music you'd heard was by Joaquin Rodrigo. Now, Rodrigo was virtually blind when he composed that piece. And pairing that piece of music with this image potentially highlights the powerful effect between the eye and the brain as they act in concert. So if we could use the eye, like I said, as a window to the brain, why exactly would we want to do this, and how would we go about doing it safely in our environment? So I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, and I've been involved in the care of a large number of children with complex neurological diseases, diseases that range from brain tumors to children with traumatic brain injury, to children with complex skull deformities that compress the brain, and a condition called hydrocephalus, where there's a buildup of fluid in the brain, progressively pressurizing the brain, uh, either due to hemorrhage or infection. And as a surgeon, I've performed now a large number of often quite complex, but very invasive procedures on the tiniest and most fragile of human beings. And these were done often as life-saving procedures. Invasive, in fact, enough that we'd often deconstruct the skull and rebuild it in a way to create more space for the brain. And this was done for a condition called raised intracranial pressure. And this means essentially that the pressure in the brain had been progressively building up to abnormal levels. And even in the modern age, the way we diagnose this, the gold standard involves drilling a hole in the skull, 
placing a cavity in the brain and directly measuring uh, this parameter. And this is essential for a large number of patients, but there's a distinct group of patients in which we could use a non-invasive diagnostic tool to prevent them or, or, or to lessen the amount of patients we subject to this. Now, children with raised intracranial pressure present in one of two ways, either very subtly if they're picked up early or incredibly dramatically and often fatally if they're picked up late. And the transition from subtle to fatal can be quite insidious. So it's quite important to pick these kids up early. Unfortunately, the vast, vast majority of the children that we treat come from the most impoverished and rural sectors of our community, not only within the Western Cape, but throughout the country and increasingly from beyond our borders, sub-Saharan Africa, with one uncomfortable consistency. They always arrive at our door later than they should have. And this tragic reality, even though it's happened to a vast number of kids, is perhaps best embodied by the singular case of little baby O. So this two-and-a-half-year-old guy whose mother realized that something was wrong with him, took him to a number of day hospitals, rural clinics, primary health care settings, secondary hospitals, even tertiary hospitals before eventually arriving at our door. And as she brought this little guy into our ward, completely wrapped in a pink blanket, and lay him on a bed very gently but with a distinct thud, one could almost sense the relief after carrying this weight for such a long time. Now, bear in mind, like I said, that we've seen more than our fair share of children presenting too dramatically. But as she opened this blanket, there was a distinct, hushed disbelief. As we looked at this little guy, tiny little body, attached to a head that had grown by now to the size of a basketball, in fact, larger than a basketball. So large, in fact, that we couldn't fit the image into a single CT scan. So large, in fact, that the skull bones had started to migrate away from each other in an effort to compensate for this progressively raised pressure. Perhaps most remarkably, as he lay there, completely anchored to a bed by this incredible weight, every morning when we'd come around on our ward round, he'd see us walking into his cubicle and he'd count from 1 to 20, perfectly. And then he'd recite the alphabet from A to Z, perfectly, almost in an effort to impress us. And you can imagine the emotional bond that, th that these sorts of uh, um, interactions have on the team treating these children, the kids themselves, and the family. But little baby O did impress us. In fact, he impressed upon us the need to expedite our search for a non-invasive technique that could be used in our setting to diagnose children with this condition earlier and potentially prevent other children in similar settings from ending up in the same situation. And as tragic as the story sounds, around about the same time, we had already been exploring the use of a non-invasive, widely used, portable, relatively cheap, and I say relatively cheap because nothing's cheap and everything's relative. And um, <laughs> so this modality was relatively cheap, but it fitted our needs. And uh, we'd been using it at that point for an intraoperative guidance technique to improve our surgical technique, both for, uh, for tumors and for, for hydrocephalus. And this, this, this quest naturally led us to the use of a technique called ultrasound. Now, most of you wouldn't associate ultrasound intuitively with neurosurgery. In fact, CT scans and MRI scans are very much the order of a neurosurgeon, and they provide us with exquisite detail. But in our setting, the distinct limitation in a resource-limited setting like ours is limited access, particularly for rural kids, to these types of modalities. So naturally, we explored ultrasound because it's one of the most ubiquitous uh, types of modalities. Now, most of you would associate ultrasound with this type of image, uh, giving you a glimpse of developing babies in the womb uh, during pregnancy. But that wasn't always the case. So ultrasound is based on a on a very simple principle of sound and wave propagation. In fact, ultrasound merely means it's above the audible human frequency. And this natural principle can be dated all the way back to the very beginning of the universe itself. In fact, some argue that it was instrumental in the forming of the universe. But as a natural phenomenon, bats use ultrasound to navigate. Dolphins and whales use ultrasound to communicate. And most recently, there's been a description of a little Chinese frog that uses ultrasound to communicate with its mate. So this incredible natural phenomenon 
made its debut into um, mainstream techno human technological uh, setting just after the uh, sinking of the Titanic, but before the, the, the outbreak of World War I, and was used to incredible effect in the sonar program where it was used to detect icebergs and submarines, and the indications for this technology unraveled. And it wasn't, wasn't long before the medical community realized the benefit of this. And uh, the first description of ultrasound was to diagnose the brain tumor, ironically. But neurosurgeons can be quite a pedantic bunch, and the imaging wasn't of a great quality. So it fell into disfavor and found a home in other specialities, specialities like obstetrics, and that's why it's become synonymous with fetal imaging. So we've used this technology to great effect, and I've just put this up to demonstrate how far things have come. So the picture on the right is the gold standard, an MRI scan. The fluffy white stuff in the middle is a tumor. You can see our ultrasound pictures on the left, very comparable, given the vast difference in cost. So how exactly would one use ultrasound combined with this window to the brain to improve diagnostics in children with raised pressure? So as the pressure in the brain builds up, what happens is the brain is continuously and uh, progressively squashed against the skull. And the fluid that normally uh, resides in this uh, space is forced out. And in an almost desperate attempt to find an exit portal from this rigid bony skull, it is forced along a sheath that connects the eye to the brain. And as it travels up along this tubular sheath, it inflates and dilates the terminal end, almost exactly like blowing up a balloon. So imagine, if you would, that the eye can act as a natural thermometer to the brain. And by placing an ultrasound probe over the closed eye, we're able to pick up the size of the sheath and take a measurement of this thermometer, give us an indication of what the pressure in the brain is. So we've conducted one of the largest prospective studies now, evaluating, having recognized the potential benefit of this technique. And we found that it has an incredibly good relationship with intracranial pressure and potential to help us diagnose this condition earlier. And that sounds incredible, in fact, too good to be true. But I'm possibly as cynical as most of you, and most things that sound too good to be true are too good to be true or often aren't true at all. And we, we recognize certain limitations, and in our study, we've addressed these. We've used a dynamic technique, which is an advancement on the current thinking. So it's allowed us to extract a huge quality of data, data that after many iterations and after a good couple of years now, we've managed to filter out the noise and show that this dynamic imaging correlates incredibly well with, with, with raised pressure. And this has allowed us to build very productive links with one of the world's leading ultrasound and navigation units. And our goal then is to refine this technique, refine the accuracy of this technique, but perhaps more importantly, simplify the acquisition method so that in a primary healthcare setting in a rural clinic, primary hospital or a secondary hospital, doctors in an emergency unit or a trauma unit, as well as neurosurgeons in a, in a tertiary center, could all with an equal amount of ease use an ultrasound probe over the eye to measure a parameter as complicated as intracranial pressure using a method as simple as using a thermometer to measure your temperature. And on a philosophical stage like this, the idea of combining a method like ultrasound, which we've heard can be dated all the way back to the origin of the universe, combining that with the concept of using the eye as a window to the soul, which we've heard predates the Bible, combining these two antiquated ideas to come up with a novel way that potentially can change the way we treat certain conditions in a South African setting is very similar to combining Mahatma Gandhi with NPF and Veiklo, and coming up with uh, an acceptable philosophical ideology for all, for most, if not all. And I'd like to sum up this incredible journey, perhaps, by saying that even if all we have is a tiny little chisel, if we sharpen it, we refine it, and we polish it, and use it to its maximum potential, what we can achieve could reverberate well beyond our borders. And even if that goes on to be completely insignificant, which it likely will do in the broader scheme of things, the fact that we must do it and do it to the best of our ability is incredibly important. And that surely must be a South African story worth spreading. Thank you.